Welcome back to CyberTalk Radio. I'm your host, Brett Pyatt, a 20-year internet security veteran. And uh, we're talking today about uh, Hacking 101. Uh, so the, the first half of the program, uh, if you were with us, uh, then you already heard this. And I apologize. And if not, we'll catch our, our listeners up who just joined us after that news, traffic, and weather update. Covered what is hacking. Um, and the short version is that's uh, using uh, experimentation and finding new ways to uh, disassemble, take things apart, break it. Um, you can do hacking on computer systems. You can do hacking not on computer systems. Now, uh, most people associate hacking with criminal behavior on the internet, and that isn't necessarily hacking. That may just be using computer security tools to break in and, and do criminal damage. Um, so hacker is not a necessarily uh, hacking itself is not necessarily a crime, and being a criminal is not necessarily make you a hacker. And so we, we covered in the first half of the program the kind of criminals behind it, um, the different types of criminal organizations, and now we're going to talk about legal hacking. Uh, so you go, well, how can hacking ever be legal? So remember, this is disassembling, kind of taking th things apart and trying to find um, unexpected uh, behavior uh, in the system. Uh, and this happens on a legal basis because you, you're out there um, doing... Uh, security research is an example. So if you're a computer security researcher uh, and you're uh, looking to uh, discover new ways to uh, get a computer to do things that the designers didn't expect, um, and then you take that information and you're, you're doing it in a lab uh, with the permission potentially needed by the actual device manufacturer because, as uh, I mentioned just before the break, just because you bought a computer doesn't mean you're actually allowed to hack it even though you, you own it. Um, there's laws against uh, reverse engineering and some of the, the other things uh, there. So be careful on uh, when, where, and how you do this. So the, the line of this being legal, it's legal to do security research as long as you have the appropriate permission in your, in, for your jurisdiction. Um, so if you're, you're in there and you're trying to find a, a way to um, make a, a computer um, CPU give you access to um, its cache memory, um, or you're trying to find a way to make the computer operating system um, let you have access to, to files that are, are stored on that computer, but they're um, assigned to a different user than your user account. Um, all of those type of things uh, are are hacking, and, and that type of stuff goes on in security research all the time. Um, in uh, kind of academic settings where people are looking for new theoretical ways to go do things. Um, and then in industrial security research as well. Um, and industrial security research doesn't mean necessarily industrial control systems. Um, that's a just a subset of what I'll call industrial security research. So this, this means that you're a business and you have security researchers in a lab doing uh, hacking on different software applications or hardware devices or uh, computer chips to uh, look for and find uh, unexpected behavior uh, in there that uh, could potentially be exploited by someone who uh, is criminal and you're trying to find that uh, before you you put that piece of software or that hardware device out there to the market or if you're a customer of uh, someone maybe you're, you're testing that equipment because uh, you want to double check um, that that they did everything in their their quality assurance and quality control testing you're you're double checking and testing it yourself uh, so this type of stuff goes on uh, all the time um, and and then what generally happens uh, in the this this legalized research hacking world is you'll see a vulnerability disclosure gets published. Um, and that vulnerability disclosure uh, could get published in all sorts of, of different ways. Um, the, the vulnerability disclosure may get um, sent to the, the vendor or the manufacturer first. Um, some people believe in what they call open disclosure, where they release the, the information to the public at the same time they release it to the, the vendor. Uh, some folks say that that open disclosure should be criminal. Um, and so this is, as a, we, we talked about um, today, open disclosure is maybe criminal, maybe not. Let's say that if you released a, an exploit uh, out there, so you found a flaw in a computer system, let's say that that computer system was used by, a, you knew it was used by um, part of our electrical grid, and you didn't notify the manufacturer, you didn't notify the, the electrical grid, and you threw this out on the internet knowing that it's likely to get picked up by a criminal and used to take down part of our electric grid. My 
my uh, not legal expert view is that probably breaks a law. Like if you were like the yelling, it's like yelling fire in a movie theater. Uh, we have freedom of speech in America, but you can't do things that you know are going to go cause panic or create harm out there. So the, I get the feeling that there's some law you would be breaking if you knew there was uh, a computer system using our utility grid and you threw a vulnerability out there on the internet that allowed someone else to go commit criminal act that that should go through some type of reasonable disclosure process now on the the flip side um the the other folks will argue if you just told the manufacturer about it and didn't tell the the actual users of it if this that flaw was leaked by somebody inside the manufacturer then you're not giving the actual utility companies knowledge of it so they can't actually go patch it and fix it themselves so even if you do what people call a, a closed disclosure, uh, it's it's not foolproof either because who do you disclose to, when, and how, and um, what if there's a leak out of that organization? How does it impact other organizations? Um, and and it, you end up in a, a complicated topic that we could uh, dive into uh, for a whole show itself on just uh, different ways to disclose uh, when, how, and what are all the different trade offs. But we'll we'll kind of stop there. There's open disclosure. Uh, where the whole world gets access to the information at the same time and then closed disclosure that follows certain sets of processes depending on what type of disclosure it is. So um, from a, a security research on the industry perspective side of things, um, this goes on all the time. Um, a kind of a, a very uh, public uh, group uh, that does this, there's a, a called Project Zero, um, where they're out looking for these, quote, zero-day flaws. And these are flaws that are unpatched by the, the vendor. So these are hackers. Um, that are not criminals. They're hackers out there looking for very powerful, like unexpected behavior and flaws in systems that allow people to do things that were they should not be allowed to do. Um, and then they work through getting those things fixed and updated to improve the security of everybody. So as I, I, I talked a little bit about in the, the first half of the program, I said as we got into this legal hacking, um, this is where there's been some legislative discussion and other things where they said, you know what, well, you shouldn't be allowed to try to reverse engineer a system. And this is uh, where we ended up with the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. So um, it, that made certain kind of reverse engineering uh, behavior uh, illegal. So you can't do that to try to break the encryption on copyright on like a music or a video file or other things that are distributed out there. Um, now, I mean, what this again means is that good people um, that want to uh, even just research that the the DRM, that uh, digital rights management software. So like, let's say I'm a good guy. I want to um, volunteer my time to look for flaws in that and then give that information back to that DRM vendor uh, to let them improve their system. Um, unless I have explicit permission from that DRM vendor, I can't go reverse engineer their software. I can't look for flaws in it. I can't uh, do research on that piece of software because the law has been passed against it. And they've said there's been some talk with with that one that we should just have a broad law that blocks us from being able to do security research on any software. You shouldn't be able to try to reverse engineer anything. And I think that's a terrible idea. I'm going to go uh, on record here real explicitly about this. It's a terrible idea because that just means that criminals, people that are already like willing to commit crimes, um, and they're going to use the th flaws that they find uh, for malicious activity, uh, those are the ones that are going to be doing the security research, and they're going to be the ones that uh, benefit from that research. We want good people doing security research and able to share that information with the organizations that need it uh, in a responsible way so that they can make the world a safer place. And and so uh, as you, you go through on this, so you've got on the, the research side for legal uh, hacking, uh, kind of academic and, and industry, uh, and then other type of legal hacking is uh, the kind of information security practitioners out there. So this these are uh, folks that are doing uh, application security. So this means they're going through um, either source code or uh, if you're giving them access to that, um, that's called white box testing where they get full access to everything and they're going to go through and look for um, ways to make your software behave in an unexpected uh, way that that generally gives people permission to do more than they should be allowed to do. Um, and then there's also what's called black box testing, which where you, you give this application security practitioner 
Um, and this kind of gets back and similarly overlaps with industrial research, but this is a little bit different. This is uh, where generally the, the author or owner of the, the application or um, system is hiring somebody specifically to uh, test the security, to try to hack the security of uh, the device or software application that they've that they've created, um, where on the and the, the delineation there on the research side is this is stuff that's generally done by customers um, or other uh, folks out in the community that believe that um, finding and and getting flaws patched helps everybody. Um, so like Google's a big backer of Project Zero um, because Google wants a safer internet. They want an internet with less security problems because then we all use the internet more and that means that we'll see more advertisements and then they'll make more money selling advertisements on the internet. If everyone decided the internet was a scary place and they didn't want to go there anymore, then uh, Google doesn't have a, a, a business that they have today. Um, so they want uh, the internet to be this nice, safe, clean place for everyone to go uh, do commerce and enjoy entertainment and all of those things. And so they have a, a vested interest, which is why they do that uh, legal security research and, and work to get things patched. Um, so uh, as you, you look at, at kind of the software um, security, and so this is security practitioners that are working on behalf of someone who's written an application um, and programming Piece, and that's the, the AppSec is what it's called and, and uh, application security code auditing and all of those type of, of things all fall into legal hacking uh, of software systems. Um, and then you get into uh, the operational security uh, side of things. So uh, this is uh, called penetration testing um, and some penetration testers are hackers and some penetration testers are just pretending to, to mimic the the same behavior that a criminal would do, except they have explicit permission uh, to do it. So let's uh, say that um, as a, a business, if I hire somebody and say, hey, I, I want you to try to break into my computer systems, I've given them permission to uh, do something that normally would be criminal. Um, and I want to test my security to make sure that criminals can't actually do it. So just because you're a penetration tester doesn't mean you're a hacker. Um, and it means you know how to use security tools to break into computer systems. Now, many uh, of the penetration testers are actually hackers because they will be um, extending those tools, experimenting, looking at writing uh, new things that will be used specifically for um, an individual environment as you, you look at the combinations and, and kind of permutations of uh, different devices and systems on networks. Those things uh, in conjunction together often create a, an unexpected flaw uh, that allow people to do things that they wouldn't be able to do. Um, and if you're uh, doing penetration testing and you're creating these new combinations, then you're uh, finding new things, then you are hacking at that point uh, and doing it in a legal way as long as the business has, has hired you and, and authorized you to go try to break into their computer systems. I think some of this on the security practitioner side of things uh, can get uh, confused by the the names of some of these industry certifications. So uh, there's an industry certification certified ethical hacker. Uh, and a lot of that goes through um, what I would consider using uh, AppSec or OpSec security tools in an ethical way. Um, but it doesn't necessarily um, rise to what I would consider hacking, which is really digging in and finding new uh vulnerabilities in systems, new flaws in systems that allow you to do things that the system operator or designer did not intend. So uh, you're listening, uh, by the way, if you uh, just hopped into your car or turned on iHeartRadio right now to 1200 WAI, this is CyberTalk Radio, uh, and uh, we've been talking about Hacking 101 here uh, for uh, about the past uh, 45 minutes now. Uh, we're going to uh, wrap up uh, this program uh, picking up where I left off before the bottom of the hour break. Um, where we uh, talked about um, kind of the process of, of hacking, uh, where people start off scanning to look for what am I going to mess around with, and then they start getting in. Maybe it's a web application where they're going to try to put in things into an email field that weren't designed um, or weren't thought about from the, the 
the programmer that designed that email address form uh, input piece. And uh, we'll continue to talk about that. If you wanted to hear uh, this program in full, uh, check out our website, www.cybertalkradio.com or your favorite podcasting app. Uh, this specific episode will go up on uh, Tuesday, November the 12th. It'll join uh, all of the other episodes of, of this program uh, out there on the Internet uh, where uh, they will likely exist until the end of time. I don't know. It, it's, it is an interesting one, though. We're always, if you, you go back and try to search for things um, kind of uh, pre-2007 uh, on the Internet these days, it's pretty difficult because uh, that's back when uh, Google first started. Um, and the search engines that existed for kind of that first Internet boom from the mid-1990s up through that point aren't really there on the Internet anymore. Their indexes are gone. Um, so and, and Google built their index when they started out. Um, and and so if a website existed back pre-2007 and it hasn't changed since then, then it's in Google's index somewhere. But if it was around from ni- in 1998 and then it vanished off the Internet, uh, Google doesn't have a record of it. So uh, it's a, an interesting one as we, we think about these things. There's an Internet archive out there that has uh, screen grabs and, and uh, background history of a bunch of different websites uh, that, that goes all, all the way back to the beginning. But um, that Internet archive is... Uh, it, not uh, really a, a regular search engine per se. So it's a it's a fun one to think that, uh, yeah, like you have to break the Internet up into these different eras uh, already, and the Internet's not even really that old. Well, the Internet, as most of us think about it and use it, is not that old, but it is did just celebrate officially its 50th birthday because um, it started off as a thing called ARPANET, and you can um, go read. There's been a bunch of news articles out there about it, but it started off at the... Uh, the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, DARPA, um, and they, or back then it was just the Advanced Research Project Agency, which is why it was called ARPANET, and they they created a the first um, network that connected separate businesses and, and organizations and entities together. Before, the super early computer networks were just inside of a single building or maybe inside of a single campus, but this whole concept of a, a global shared uh, network uh, was not uh, thought of out there. And really the first folks connecting to that network were a bunch of academic institutions uh, that uh, didn't think about security first, which is uh, why we get into a lot of where we are today, where you wonder, like, why is everything not so safe on the Internet? And it's not any different than the way we expanded and rolled out uh, anything else. If you you uh, look and you watch a, a Western movie and you, you look at the front door of the saloon in the Western movie, and it's just a little pair of swinging doors. Like, there's no deadbolt lock on the set of swinging doors. Like, if the saloon was not open, someone could just walk in the saloon, steal the table, and leave. Um, and, and like, security wasn't thought about there on the front door of that saloon. Um, and same thing with the, the Internet as it started off. Security was not thought about first. People were worried about uh, being able to share information uh, and, and how to get that to flow back and forth as easily as possible. So... Now, uh, back off of my short tangent there on the birthday <laughs> of the Internet. So uh, if you are going out there and you're, you're trying to figure out, well, what, am I, like, what do I want to experiment with? What do I want to hack on? And you, you go through and scan things, and then you start uh, testing out forms on a, a, a piece of software. Um, that's one way to do it. Another uh, way is that folks will uh, experiment with things is they'll uh, download a software application onto their computer uh, and then... There's uh, more software development tools called a, a, a decompiler. So this takes um, this software, um, and, and the way software works is um, people write software in what's called a programming language. So uh, one of the most common ones is uh, C, C++, um, and, and that's uh, what most of the software that runs on your computer is probably that runs as kind of an executable thing is written likely in C, C++, or some kind of derivative thereof. And... The compiler that allows you to take that software source code that people can read and write easily, it compiles it down into uh, machine code because the computer CPU chip, the the chip from Intel or AMD, uh, doesn't process C code itself. It processes what's called machine code. Um, And so what the decompiler does is it takes the machine code and tries to translate it from machine code back into C or C++ so that you can then read uh, as a person that source code better. Um, So you can download the app onto your computer, and then you can uh, decompile it, um, and then what you'll often do from there is recompile it with debugging flags set on. So what this will allow you to do is is, uh, step through the program um, and 
stop it at different points, uh, maybe where the, the designer of the software didn't intend it to be stopped. I mean, you can see how it behaves. So this is a lot of, of what goes on on the kind of software application uh, uh, hacking level, looking for uh, ways to um, change the information stored in memory at certain points in time in the program and then see how the program behaves. Um, and and this is uh, often, uh, as you'll, you'll see, vulnerability disclosure lists out there. People will find ways to... Uh, uh, overflow memory, um, crash the application, um, and then depending on uh, how that application is running on the computer, maybe if it's running with super user administrative privileges and you're a regular user on there, can you figure out how to send information to that program uh, in a way that allows you to then um, execute code of your own at that super user privilege level? So this is a lot of what kind of the security software hacking research is about. It's about uh, privilege escalation. That's where or much of the uh, the research time goes into is, is looking for not just flaws that, that crash the thing, um, but flaws that allow you to uh, execute additional code. Uh, and uh, that in the kind of research and hacking community, there's a uh, local privilege escalations, which means you kind of physically have access to the the device, or you have access to um, and put some piece of software on the device so that you can run that code locally on it. Um, and those so those are called local privilege escalation um, at ex exploits, um, where it's a flaw in there that a hacker discovers. Um, and then the, the, the big one uh, that everyone likes from a security research perspective, if you uh, discover these, then uh, it, it's one where uh, you get um, some security research credit um, in a way and, um, and can show your skills as a remote privilege escalation. So this means that you can um, send code to another computer. You don't have any software installed on it, and, and that allows you to execute uh, arbitrary code of your own on on that system and these are um, that remote privilege escalation uh, is is the way where uh, generally criminals uh, buy tools uh, from hackers that have remote privilege escalation uh, attacks built into them and those remote privilege escalation attacks allow the criminal to go from maybe not having access to your computer to getting user level access so that's a privilege escalation before they weren't on your computing system now they they were able to execute code from uh, remotely that that reached your system uh, that allowed to get them user level privilege and then once they have user level privilege on the system then they might use a second uh, exploiter you might if you were hacking and researching look for a second exploit to go from user level privilege up to administrative privilege um, and then once you you have uh, administrative privilege. Uh, then you're, you you own the system effectively, and you can do all sorts of other criminal mischief things that are, are not necessarily hacking. So hopefully this was an informative uh, introduction into at least what one person's perspective, uh, who knows a little bit about cybersecurity, thinks uh, hacking is. Uh, if you uh, want to uh, continue this discussion, uh, CyberTalk Radio is out there. Uh, we are active on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, we never really figured out the Instagrams, um, so... And I guess I heard now that you have to be a logged in user. You have to have a separate Instagram account to, to log into Instagram as of this last week. Um, you can no longer just browse Instagram profiles publicly. Um, but uh, yeah, so if you, you want to reach us without having to have an account uh, or see what we talk about, you can you can browse our Twitter feed still. That does not require you to be logged in. Uh, if, uh, Facebook will require you to have a user account, and uh, you can uh, really communicate with us there. Uh, if you do want to communicate with us on Twitter, you will have to create a Twitter account. Uh, you can also reach out to us, though, uh, on our website at www.cybertalkradio.com. We have a, a form uh, there where you can contact the show uh, and uh, ask us whatever questions you have. Uh, if you would like to hear um, certain topics uh, or want us to go into uh, something else where we, we haven't covered it on the program, uh, please let us know. And uh, we'll work to uh, get a guess or uh, maybe we'll just have me rant again for a whole hour. So, James, do you think anyone listened to this one? Yeah, I think it's a good episode. I think so? Yeah. Did I leave any big questions here? Because I think we've got about a minute where I could Gosh. answer one more thing for, for anyone. So if there's anything that's top of mind, if you were listening to this, you're like, man, I wish the host answered. We've covered a lot. Yeah, we did. It's a lot to digest in that 50 was, minutes. Yeah, so we'll, we'll put a recap up along with this uh, when it goes up on our website. Uh, so you can read the Reader's Digest version. We'll link out to a bunch of different uh, areas about this, some of those vulnerability disclosure lists and whatnot. Um, and uh, with that, I thank you for sticking with us. If you're uh, checking us out on the podcast, uh, 
this is uh, you missed a news, traffic, and weather update that was not relevant to you. And if you uh, do want to listen live, we're on Saturday nights uh, and uh, after the uh, best basketball team uh, in America. And with that, thank you. And this was Cyber Talk Radio. Welcome to Cyber Talk Radio. I'm your host, Brett Pyatt, a 20-year internet security veteran. And uh, this week, uh, it's mostly going to be me having a conversation <laughs> with you about hacking. Uh, so if you're curious about what is a hacker, um, how, what do hackers do, um, are they all criminals, uh, stick with us here on Cyber Talk Radio. Uh, my producer, James, is with me in the uh, studio this week. If you uh, happen to watch us on YouTube, you'll see a still photo of James and I as uh, we have this conversation. <laughs> If you are going to listen to us on a podcasting service, this will be uh, up on our website at www.cybertalkradio.com on Tuesday, November the 12th, uh, somewhere around 10 a.m. That's usually about the time we, we get it up there. It'll also be uh, out on uh, all of the different podcasting apps. If you use a podcasting app and you do not see Cybertalk Radio there with nice episode descriptions and titles and everything, uh, please reach out to us on Facebook or Twitter at Cybertalk Radio. Let us know. We will get that fixed and... Uh, we will uh, get you a CyberTalk Radio t-shirt. That's one of two ways to earn a, a CTR t-shirt. Uh, the other is to become a, a guest on the program. So if you see folks uh, around the cybersecurity community uh, wearing a CyberTalk Radio t-shirt and uh, you want to know who they are and really what they're up to, you can ask them their name and then come back and uh, check out our archives and listen to uh, their conversation uh, on the program. So now back uh, to uh, today's topic, uh, hacking and hackers. And so um, it's been popularized, I guess, as kind of as far back um, in the uh, the movies. Um, you, you go uh, back to uh, War Games. I think it was was that Matthew Broderick. Matthew Broderick, yeah. Matthew Broderick, yeah. So uh, back when he hacked into the Whopper, um, which was part of <laughs> NORAD, and um, was to just to play a game of global thermonuclear war uh, with the computer, which actually then freaked a bunch of people out because they thought it wasn't a game. They thought it was a real. The Russians really launching missiles at us. So, mm-hmm. um, and then it's it's been popularized in, in kind of Hollywood movies um, on up through to uh, hackers with Sandra Bullock. Now there's a TV series out there, Mr. Robot, um, and this is kind of the computer programmer hacker um, that's breaking into computer systems, um, and maybe they work for somebody, maybe they're a kid experimenting, uh, maybe it's it's international espionage and and all of these sorts of things happening in on computers. Uh, that's not really most of what's going on out there so just to start off overall with hacking um what what is it and it it, and ultimately um hacking itself i'll I'll give my definition you could go read on wikipedia or lots of others but it the way i think about it it's it's taking a technology system uh and breaking it down into its components to understand it looking for flaws uh, in there that may allow you to do things in the the system uh, that was not programmed originally by the or intended by the original folks programming it so um, it, hacking isn't always uh, malicious with the intent to uh, go uh, cause harm to some other party hacking may just be that you're you're finding um, a, a, a way in a game uh, if you're uh, from a computer game to uh, efficiently uh, gain levels or whatever else and, and it was something that wasn't originally kind of thought about by the the authors uh, but you're uh, figuring out how to play the game in a different way that's more efficient than they really intended. Um, all the way on through to where you are getting into computer source code or other things like where you're actually modifying the game. Um, and then at that point, you're you're now doing hacking where you're changing what the uh, original authors intended. Um, and that's still hacking. And, and you could, if you're playing on your own computer and you're playing your own game and you want to give yourself superpowers in a game, um, uh, and some of the, the uh, game developers even know that people are going to want to do this, so they just program in hidden codes um, so that 
it it kind of makes this balance with the hackers on computer games that they don't go um, in and try to really reverse engineer things and and change the code. I think one of the the uh, the famous ones uh, there was a, a game called Contra back on the uh, Nintendo, uh, the original Nintendo, and mm-hmm. and if you were on the the opening screen, there was some character combination up down up down left right left right A B select start something like that. Mm-hmm. I may have played a fair amount of Contra with myself <laughs> as a kid. And uh, that would get you 30 lives to play through the game instead of three. Uh, and could you like plug a, a, a loader cartridge into your Nintendo and give yourself 300 lives? Yeah, you probably could go figure out where in the memory to go edit the number of lives and change that. And, and that would be an example of, of hacking um, that's not really malicious uh, in the sense that it's not harming anyone else. It's allowing you to play a video game. Uh, maybe it's allowing you to get to the end of the game faster um, and and not have to practice your skills as much. Maybe you're cheating yourself, but you're not really harming anyone else. So uh, I think when, when people think about uh, hacking, they think criminal organization or criminal mischief kid like the Matthew Broderick back there in War Games, and that's really not all um, what hacking's about. Uh, so uh, now that we've kind of gone through and defined what is hacking, I'm going to go through with... Who are all the the different types of, of folks that uh, do hacking for a, a living? Um, and you can legally do hacking for a living. Um, and you can also be a criminal and do hacking for a living. Uh, so I'll, I'll start uh, going through on the, the criminal side of things and, and talk about kind of what's really going on out there on the Internet right now uh, and and what are what am I seeing from from where I sit uh, in the community um, and hearing about uh, from a, a hacker perspective out there uh, on the internet? And we're gonna gonna differentiate a couple of folks uh, here in categories as we go through this because you can be a computer criminal on the internet and not be a hacker. Um, and and I'll, I'll explain the difference uh, here as we we continue on. So the first up is. That criminal mischief hacker, it's the, the, the teenager in the basement. And this makes up a very small percentage of the, the hacking going on out there right now. I think there's there's kids that are messing around. There's kids that are learning programming languages. There are kids that are trying to, to do mischievous things with it. Uh, but it's not a vast majority of the, the hacking that's going on uh, these days on the Internet. Um, and if you were as a teenager to go out and deface somebody's website or get into a website to, to give yourself whatever, uh, take things from them, uh, gain access to confidential or proprietary information on that website, that is a criminal offense. Um, and that's, uh, something that is, is out there. It does go on. Um, it's not causing a lot of damage to businesses, um, and it, it's one uh, where you're pretty likely these days um, to get caught doing it. Um, the Internet is not the easiest place to uh, keep yourself secret, even if you're trying to tunnel through VPNs and other stuff. Uh, we've uh, had some other programs uh, talking about uh, data privacy and, and kind of uh, security on this. So you can uh, learn more about the kind of how things are uh, surveilled on the Internet and what's going on these days by checking out our archives. So I won't go into that here, but. Um, I don't recommend kids going out there and experimenting uh, on the internet. It, things will get tracked down. You will have someone show up at your door, and it will be a, a, a long and a hard conversation uh, with uh, to explain to your parents. Uh, or if you're a parent yeah, and your teenager is doing these sorts of things, I would expect eventually to get a uh, someone knocking at your door. The uh, real hacking that's going on on the internet, there's predominantly uh, two types of organizations that are doing this in a criminal way. So there's organized crime, and some of the organized crime on the Internet is just using existing tools. So they're just buying tools from people. Uh, they aren't actually hacking at all. They're using these tools to to break in. Um, and so this is where I kind of go back to that definition of hacking is is getting in, figuring out the system, breaking the components down, and, and that's not buying a a set of tools from somebody else and then just using those tools. That's just criminal robbery um, and breaking and entering. Instead of a physical breaking and entering, that's a digital breaking and entering. So like if I went to Home Depot and I bought a, a hammer and I smashed somebody's door, that doesn't make me a physical hacker. So same thing, like if the criminals are buying a digital hammer and breaking into somebody's business with it, that's just criminal. 
Um, it's not hacking. So, and I think that the community, and this is my perspective on those things. I think that the community doesn't draw that distinction or the general public doesn't draw that distinction. Somebody breaking into a computer website, they just call a hacker. Um, and uh, I think that it, it's one where, um, it doesn't do a, a service because as, as we're trying to figure out how to have law and order on the internet, you, we can't think about, uh, hackers and, criminals in the same mindset and this is as we continue on the program probably the second half we'll be going into a lot of the the legal places where hacking is done and if some of these laws get passed uh, it makes it difficult for us to do the legal things that need to go on in order for us to secure software systems and secure secure technology platforms so uh, you can't make some of these activities illegal or you're going to have only the bad folks doing them um, because if they're going to do security research to commit crimes, they already plan on committing crimes, which likely have a bigger penalty than the security research itself. Um, so uh, with the organized crime, though, many of them now have become hackers because they've scaled up their organized crime or, uh, uh, teams, and those teams have uh, malware engineers. They have folks that are, are reverse engineering software systems. They have... Uh, folks doing security research. So uh, the larger organized criminal or, uh, teams uh, have all of the same things that a a business would, or even um, some of the 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 nation state folks. And we'll we'll talk about them here in this sort of a criminal area um, as well. Um, and I'll get to them in a minute. Then the second type of a kind of big category of criminal hacking that goes on out there is uh, people that are mission based. So. Uh, this is uh, where somebody is uh, for or against some type of political issue. I'll just pick one that's easy to talk about. So say if you were strongly anti-abortion, um, you might want to go hack the Planned Parenthood website and take the Planned Parenthood off the Internet so that people can't go have conversations about uh, abortion and reproductive rights. On the flip side of the coin, say you're very strong pro-choice, you might want to go hack some organization that's out there on the internet talking to people about making different choices. If, if you're for um, some type of uh, environmental organization, you may want to go hack a, a, a an oil company. If you are um, believe that um, some other agency or, or entity out there is doing something that you disagree with, you're going to go hack that entity for a specific mission and purpose. Um, this is criminal, the same as people that have the criminal intent to go steal money from an organization. If you're breaking into their systems with the intent to shut them down, do harm, um, and or even just look around, uh, you're committing crimes, and there's these mission-based folks that are out there um, uh, doing this. And this kind of spans the gambit of highly organized groups um, to... Uh, very much individual sort of lone wolf. Uh, most of the successful organizations uh, that are breaking into entities and causing this mission-based uh, criminal harm are an organization and a group. Uh, hacking's becoming uh, more complicated. The basic security measures that are, are being taken out there on the internet uh, make it much more difficult for the, the lone wolf uh, hacker sitting there by themselves to to really go affect things uh, these days. Um, you need a, a larger team and a coordinated attack. Uh, every once in a while, you, you still do have one of these lone wolves, but that's not mostly uh, what uh, is is driving that behavior uh, out there. And these mission-based folks, again, they can be just a, a cyber criminal. Um, if they're buying tools from somebody else, they can also be hackers if they are uh, getting in and, and doing the hacking activities of breaking systems down, reverse engineering them, looking for, for flaws or, or unexpected behavior or um, configuration errors uh, where they can gain access to something that they shouldn't have access to. Yeah, so then the, the third category of, of criminal hacking, and I, uh, in my, my show prep notes on this one, I've got kind of a squiggly line here for this, this uh, category of folks um, because – Nation states um, can, if they're hacking each other and they're hacking other uh, government and military targets, um, there's not a real clear set of uh, rules of war and what is war and is not war on the Internet right now. So that's that's for nation states to figure out as they attack each other back and forth. If you have a nation state attacking a private citizen or private enterprise inside of a country, uh, that 
falls into likely breaking laws in in those nations. It's not legal for them to, even if they work for the other country's government, to hack a private uh, business or private citizen in another country. Um, they would be breaking the laws of that target country. They might not be breaking the laws of their home country. Um, so this nation state one is kind of a messy, squiggly line area. Um, they're not just randomly running around the internet hacking targets of opportunity. Um, the nation states are, are out there. Um, the same way, if you go back before the internet, we all the nations had spy organizations and the rest of those. They're not just running around trying to um, uh, obtain assets um, and, and compromise folks that don't uh, accomplish some bigger, broader mission for them. So this is all very targeted, whether it's uh, intellectual property theft or whether it's um, uh, access to um, information that they want to then use for political purposes or other things. They all have very specific targets. Um, you're not likely to end up with a nation state just uh, going after you or ransomwareing your home computer. That's not the kind of things uh, that they're they're really doing at a, a large level. Some of the um, smaller nation states uh, out there uh, that uh, do have a, a dictator-led economy uh, do have a organized crime, I'm going to call it, the nation-state team that just is out there doing revenue collection for that country's government. So, um, I'm, and that type of stuff, I, I would not really lump them in a sort of the, the typical the way people think about nation states. They just happen to be a nation that is also an organized crime, uh, or, and their specific purpose is to hack targets of opportunity to steal money from them. Um, and that's the, the goal of organized crime. They want to get money the easiest way possible. Right now, organized crime happens to be on the internet because it's an easy way to get money. But if it was easier just to uh, walk up in front of uh, uh, Lou's Italian meatballs and ask Lou for $2,000 to make sure that his restaurant stays safe, then the organized crime folks would be doing that instead of, of breaking into computers on the internet. You're listening to 1200 WAI. This is Cyber Talk Radio. Uh, I'm the host, Brett Pyatt. We're uh, going through hacking, uh, what it is, uh, what's the difference between a hacker and a, a internet criminal. Uh, if you, you uh, just uh, hopped in your car and turned on your radio right now or uh, opened up a web browser and are streaming us via iHeartRadio uh, in that browser or maybe on your mobile phone in the iHeartRadio app, uh, thank you for tuning in. Uh, this whole program will go up on our website, www.cybertalkradio.com, as well as that iHeartRadio radio site on a Tuesday, uh, November the 12th. It'll be up there with uh, all uh, 150 plus uh, of our, our other episodes of this program where we talk about everything from uh, Cyber Patriot, which is a team sport in uh, middle school and high school uh, for uh, kids to learn how to uh, defend from uh, cyber criminals and people trying to break into their systems. Uh, and uh, it teaches them all the benefits of team sport, teaches them valuable cybersecurity skills, which they can then use to uh, go on to major in uh, cybersecurity in college or um, maybe even just go out and uh, start working uh, in the industry as a security analyst uh, as they, they get out of high school with some certifications. So if you want to learn uh, more about Cyber Patriot, we've done uh, a number of episodes there with uh, kids, uh, with the um, head of uh, Cyber Patriot, actually, uh, retired Brigadier General Bernie Scotch, and uh, much more. Uh, so uh, lots to learn about there. The new uh, season just started up. It almost overlaps with football season, uh, but not exactly. Uh, and uh, this is the, the 12th year that Cyber Patriot's been around um, and growing like crazy, especially in a San Antonio area where this uh, program is hosted, uh, thanks to the uh, Cyber Texas Foundation. And uh, we've had the Cyber Texas folks uh, on um, the program also, so you could uh, learn uh, about what Joe and his team uh, over there are doing to uh, support our cybersecurity community and really uh, help us uh, expand uh, Cyber Patriot uh, as a sport for kids to go play in school. So back to uh, today's topic. So about this kind of hacking criminals and mischief and all of these sorts of things. So as people uh, go through this, and we'll we'll talk a little bit more about activities that go on uh, in hacking. Um, here as we uh, head to uh, bottom of the hour break and then the second half of the program I'll talk um, in some more depth about legal types of hackers the first half of the program we've covered criminal hackers we'll cover legal hackers in that second half so now we're going we're to go through and talk about uh, different hacking activities 
and these activities may or may not be criminal depending on where and when and how you're doing them. Um, and we're not going to go here uh, and try to say where that line is. Uh, that's up for you to figure out in your local jurisdiction with uh, your your laws. Um, the, the short rule of thumb is if you don't own the computers or you aren't on a security team that has explicit permission from your business to do these things, they're probably illegal. Um, and, and so if you think about it there, if it's your computer, then you can generally mess around with it. But that's not even always the case with um, laws in the U.S., such as the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. You may not even be able to mess around with your computer or with your own with software on your own computer. So uh, just understand what your, your laws are uh, out there. Uh, go ask someone who is a legal expert, um, an attorney on this, if you really are going to get in and start doing these things, um, because uh, you don't want to trip over the laws and I don't want to give you the, the wrong advice here. So generally, if it's your own computer, you can probably do things, but that's not even always the case um, because you really don't own your own computer or have complete rights to all of the things that are on uh, that computer that you have. So with that said, uh, the the first uh, thing from a, a hacking perspective uh, is that uh, folks will go through and look for um, areas where they can find something to dig in uh, and research. So there's tools that um, automate some of this activity. They're called a scanner. And that scanner will go out and look um, and talk to the computer and look at what kind of applications are running on it. It will reach out over the network and look at the, the applications running uh, on the network that are accessible from that computer. And, and then the, many of these scanners will tell you uh, what kind of operating system the different devices are running, uh, maybe what um, even version of the application that it's reaching out and communicating with. They'll give you a bunch of, of just an inventory of information to start um figuring out uh, what and where you you wanted to to look at for configuration issues um, so another one um, and this is is a spot so many systems have default um, configurations and uh, if uh, you've been reading and keeping up with the uh, the Equifax um, hack and some of the the legal cases that have been going on uh, since that that hack happened um, I'll, I'll give an example here one of the the databases that they had set up there um, the username was admin that uh, short for administrator and the password on that database was admin this is the uh, the default on that set of database software if you create a database the username is admin the password is admin and no one changed it in that case so you go well like this isn't criminal for me to log into that database they left the password that way it's fine for me to go in there that's not the case if it's not your computer um, it's the same thing like if someone leaves their front door to their house unlocked it's not okay for you to go inside the house and look around uh, so, and it's certainly not okay for you to go inside the house and take something and then leave and go, well, if they didn't want me to go in the house and take something, they should have locked the door. Using default passwords, uh, is not really hacking. That's just being a computer criminal. Um, uh, any, it, it does not require hacking skills, uh, in order to use a scanning tool and then go at the equivalent of walking down the street, checking doorknobs. That's all it's doing. This is then that doesn't make you. Um, as someone who can design lock picks, uh, and it doesn't even make you someone who can use lock picks. It just makes you someone that's going around looking for people that have made configuration errors. Um, and that's not a hacker. So after, let's say you've gone through and you've, you've scanned, um, systems and you found something you want to start looking at, uh, in more detail or trying to experiment with. So say you've got a, a website, uh, and that website takes, uh, it has inputs, forms on it. So like maybe you can uh, sign up for a mailing list or you can uh, join a uh, the website and it's got a, a user account creation form. So this is a case where now you can start instead of just like where it said, asks for your email address on there. Instead of putting an email address uh, in that form, you could start putting other things. You could put yeah, Unicode characters. You could start... Uh, seeing how the website reacts to things that the authors of the software didn't expect. If they labeled a form field as email, 
they expected people to put an email address there. But what happens if I use things that aren't allowed to be uh, characters in an email address? You can't use uh, extended ASCII Unicode uh, in, in most email systems. Um, and, and many forms may not have expected uh, you to do that. Or if you uh, escape characters out or, or other things there, you start doing that. Now you're, you're in the realm of, of hacking. You're experimenting. You're trying um, something new, trying to discover uh, how a system behaves. And that's really uh, kind of what hacking uh, is fundamentally. And, and it doesn't necessarily mean if you're doing this on your own computer um, you're and you're doing it on a, a service that you've set up yourself, you're just doing security testing. And uh, this will uh, lead us into uh, where I'm going to head on the second half of the program. So we're going to take a quick break now on CyberTalk Radio for news, traffic, and weather update. Uh, we will be right back after that uh, where we will continue discussing uh, Hacking 101. 